So on behalf of the Energy Institute, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Rai. Um, it's our pleasure to have you here and to host you at the Energy Institute seminar series. Um, it has been uh, a long time since uh, I met uh, uh, Varun uh, in, a, in a meeting for the Energy Institutes. And uh, since then, I really admire his work and his passion in energy related uh, topics. Um, just a small uh, background on uh, his, uh, his knowledge and his skills. He's a professor at the School of Public Affairs, uh, where he directs the Energy Systems Transformation Research Group and in the Mechanical Engineering Department. Uh, I'm all, I always I admire his interdisciplinary research uh, at the interface of energy systems, behavioral science, complex systems, and policy. Uh, focuses on enabling a broad diffusion of sustainable energy technologies, and uh, that's on a global scale. So it's not only on a national scale. Yeah, obviously, uh, all this work uh, has ended up in, uh, in publishing uh, numerous journal articles in a well-known and highly ranking uh, journals. And uh, today, uh, he will uh, he, he offer he will offer us a presentation on sustaining the energy transition, building up through communities. So Varun, welcome. Uh, we are really eager to hear uh, more about your work, and uh, uh, we the, the way that uh, this presentation structured. There are about thirty to forty minutes for you to present. Um, the attendees, the participants, if they have any questions, they can type it at the bottom. And also the participants should uh, stay muted the whole duration of, the, of, the, uh, of your presentation. So thank you again and, and welcome. So the microphone is yours. Great. Uh, Valentin, you want to make sure you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for that introduction, I'm very delighted. Uh, a big part of the pleasure is to be able to talk to colleagues at AM, uh, just so close to UT where, where I am based. And you know, we all talk about interacting more, collaborating more. And you know, so you know, that's a part of the special joy that I'm able to join uh, that enterprise and spirit. Uh, I know many folks at AM and you know, I've really enjoyed and admired the work that goes on there. Uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, there are many ideas that uh, ran through my head, but the one I chose is the one I really think goes at the center of what we are talking about, what we are dealing with, and could have uh, the most profound impact of where we eventually land uh, over the next few uh, decades. And that's the reason it's not an easy or obvious uh, topic. <laughs> it involves many different complex uh, notions as, as I'll try to highlight. Um, and my effort by no means uh, is to hash out a complete scoping of what, what we're dealing with, or for that matter, to propose a, a clear set of solutions. Rather, uh, my effort is just to uh, make some substantive points, uh, highlight why this is necessary, and make some suggestions uh, for ways we can go about doing this. But, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this, as well as uh, other areas. So I just wanted to set that uh, context. I basically want to make three points. One, uh, I don't think needs making a point, at least not for this audience, uh, but I'll you know, start there anyway, which is uh, why are we even talking about decarbonization? Why is it necessary? So you know, we'll, we'll start there. Uh, and then from there really comes my next two points, which is we must build this change and transition bottom up. Um, and I'll present some arguments uh, not drawn from any one paper, not necessarily drawn just from my own work, rather bringing in uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, work that has been going in in the broader area to basically make that point. And then finally, to suggest some fruitful and, and effective ways of going about doing so, building bottom up uh, with the community without claiming to have a full solution. Again, this is work in progress for me and, and hundreds of other uh, colleagues are around the world. Uh, I will keep it a little bit high level. I do understand that the audience is pretty broad including students, faculty, researchers, both at universities, but then also you know, outside of the universities. Actually, I saw folks in the audience uh, who I interact outside of the uh, university setting. Uh, there are you know, collaborators and interactors uh, in non-academic settings. Um, and then I'll also try uh, to give you an introduction to this emerging literature in the social sciences uh, that talks about energy transition, but, but goes to some very fundamental 
aspects of societies and and behavior and you know how big changes happen or can happen um, and what it means for for us now so with that uh, background let me just you know get going uh, why decarbonize right uh, again as i said i don't think you know this audience needs uh, to be convinced much uh, but this report uh, the assessment report from working group 1 from ipcc just came out uh, a little over a month ago um, and reemphasizes many of the things that we have known for quite some time but you know in in, in much starker and in much more confident fashion uh, on the left you see you know something we all have seen uh, the rapid temperature rises uh, and the right you see you know uh, why there is very high confidence that it's caused due to uh, human uh, factors uh, that's an increase in uh, global temperature on the very right you see three different types of impacts of what happens uh, when this happens uh, and you know the three impacts are increasing heat events, heavy precipitation, drought, and in each of these have, and this is kind of a world map, um, and the impact is heterogeneous, but in some cases, for example, uh, more drastic heat events, those are more uniformly spread, as well as there is very high confidence uh, that you know, that is what is happening because of you know, global warming. Uh, and then, you know, other impacts like heavy precipitation, varies in confidence, varies in you know, where it is happening, uh, and, and then moving on to drought. And there are a whole number of other things that happens. Uh, right, so you know this. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with, but but there is you know really uh, much more detailed level of uh, information that goes into making those uh, assertions. Uh, now, looking forward, right, uh, where we'll end up, uh, we can certainly kind of uh, run some models and numbers, and and here is one look at that again from the same report, uh, looking at three different uh, situations end of the century. So 1.5 degree warming, two and four degrees warming, uh, right? And you see, uh, you know, the, the more red it is, the darker it is, you know, the more warming, obviously, but then there are two things that you see. Uh, in general, the land areas warm more than the oceans. And second, the Arctic and Antarctica, they warm heat up more than uh, the rest. Uh, and so, you know, but, but so, and that's important that you look at the scale, you know, by the time you're talking two degrees rise and certainly by the time when we're talking about four degree average global warming, uh, the, the Arctic, Antarctic, you know, they're seeing as high as, you know, up to seven or so potential uh, degree. And, you know, that, that's very, very uncharted territory, but that's not the point. The point is this all leads to uh, where do we want to end up and what it means for uh, our greenhouse gas emissions. And, and at the bottom right, you see some scenarios of what types of emission profiles globally could lead to one of one or you know, other of these uh, temperature or global warming scenarios. Uh, there, there are two things I want to highlight. There's a lot in here, but I don't want to go into de detail, but, but just a couple of highlights. One is obviously that amount we emit, you know, that's, that's linearly, uh, related to the temperature rises, and you know this all basically leads to uh, this this notion of a carbon carbon budget and also a profile, right? You know, uh, for example, you know in in this SP one one point nine, which corresponds roughly to the one point uh, five degree rise, uh, you have to very quickly go down to zero emissions, net zero emissions by twenty fifty. But then after that, you actually have to go negative. So it's it's not as if just doing net zero, but you have to basically suck out carbon from the atmosphere and, and so on, right? You know, depending on what type of profile you have, you know, it corresponds to those temperature rises. So, so I, the main point for remaining of the discussion is that uh, the way we choose to emit uh, and the timelines, uh, they, they directly impact where we'll end up uh, in terms of our global warming profile. Uh, end of this century, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, the types of impacts you know, that, that we'll uh, expect to uh, encounter. And so this timing aspect, right, talking about the next three to five decades is actually very, very instrumental. And that is where, uh, you know, some of my core remarks today around, you know, building bottom up, bringing community, bringing the people in uh, are, are actually going to be uh, relevant. Uh, I wanted to bring this up, right? This is a pivot point. And, you know, as I said, I chose to focus the whole discussion uh, around communities, around people, around core social values um, and you know we we all are are part of this you know uh, social contract this this system that we all co-created uh, which values 
uh, justice, peace, security, and, and freedom, liberty, right? And not just for us, also for posterity, for future generations. And you know, that's, that's, that's the core, that's kind of the social contract that we have now with, with our, uh, within our society, between ourselves and, and our government. And again, you know, this is, this is very high level. I'm not a constitutional expert, but uh, there, it, it is very contested. Even what these mean and the forms that they take, it's actually very uh, contested, right? But, but nonetheless, you know, these are the broader values that we, uh, that we all operate within. Now, thinking about the, the transition, you know, it's very, very important to map all the things we do or try to do, all the things we try to put in place, to invest in, to build, uh, to transition people in communities, uh, in companies, in sectors, to map them back to these values. It's, it's very important that we are consistent with these. And you know, obviously, you know, that this the last, uh, you know, this, this has been an, an evolution in progress for the last you know, several centuries uh, across the world, but especially here in the US in the last you know, uh, decade, a uh, couple decades, you know, it just becomes so much more uh, important, these aspects of uh, social justice and, and value. So keeping that in mind, as we think about energy transition becomes very important. I want to bring this this uh, recent work by a uh, colleague Benjamin Sovakul, uh, who mapped out. This is you know just focused on published literature as to what what do scholars think uh, who will be impacted through the transition, right? So there, there are two sides of the coin. You know, one one obviously are you know folks who will be impacted by global warming itself, right? So these are the coastal communities, but you know you know almost in everybody else because you know it has. It is all linked to security and food and water and whatnot. So everyone is going to be impacted, but you know there are, there are folks who obviously are more impacted are, are more obviously impacted than, than others. Uh, but this is the other side of the coin. You know these, these are these are or, or at least in some ways the other side of the coin, which is also thinking folks as you transition industries and sectors and infrastructure, uh, what else do we you know, typically not think about, but who else might be uh, impacted? Uh, Long story short here that if you look at the top uh, categories of concern, you know, those are all highlighting on communities. Uh, communities could be based on geography, communities could be based on profession, uh, communities could be based on ethnicity or you know, income group and so on. So the, the, you know, the, the, the impacts are all you know, somehow mapped back to these, these parts of the, the communities. And you know, it, it's again, uh, it, it maps in different ways to different parts of you know, our economy and society, but, but certainly communities figure front and center. Uh, <clears throat> some other work, uh, in, and, and what I'm trying to do is just to give you a flavor first of uh, the, the broader dimensions of what we're talking about. Uh, this is some very interesting work by another colleague, uh, Sanya Karli from uh, Indiana University, where uh, they looked at uh, transition in, in ongoing transition in coal communities and in particular in West Virginia. And here, here are some uh, quotes from the interviews they did. Uh, I feel people really are, I feel people are really bitter and nobody has their interest at heart. They feel like the country used them for energy while it bothered them. And now it, when it's done, they kind of like forget. And then the other one is there's also a sense of grief that comes along with it. You know, coal mining is really part of the culture and it's, it's interwoven into people, the way people feel about themselves and their identity and their identity as a community, right? This is just one of you know, many, many, many different examples that we already know of and, and are in the process of, of knowing of that, that basically highlights you know, the other side of the story too. And it's, it's a transition that involves all of us, uh, whether we are just entering it or have been part of it you know, for, for decades and in some cases, uh, centuries, uh, right? So it's very important. And in oftentimes, what we do, and I have been guilty of that myself. Uh, Valentini mentioned I'm an engineer by training. Uh, I'm, I have a joint appointment here in engineering to talk about models and to talk about technologies and innovation as if you know that's what is uh, just uh, end, end all by itself. Uh, and, and it's very, very important, uh, the technology, economics, innovation. Uh, I spend most of my time th thinking about those, but it's equally important, if uh, perhaps more important, uh, to think about all these other deeper issues and how they impact people, communities, and so on, because otherwise uh, it's it's going to be very very difficult to meet all of this in three to five decades. And that that's the theme. Basically, I'll keep coming coming back to again and again. Other example I want to highlight uh, is this one is a very recent study 
Uh, this came out just a few weeks ago uh, about the Gujarat Solar Park in India, where uh, you know this this is a very very big utility scale uh, project that was built about a decade or so ago, um, and you know it it was done with international fanfare. It's a fantastic, it's a world class uh, project. Uh, the the work itself highlights the struggles of the communities around the project itself, uh, right? And, and in particular, uh, it highlights you know, the, the plight, if you will, of uh, folks in this Taranka village, uh, where despite a lot of infrastructure that has been built for flow of materials and resources and you know, uh, water to the solar park, uh, you know, basically the, the condition of folks in this village who actually offered up land for, for the park is actually worsened, uh, you know, from all perspectives. They don't get electricity, water uh, situation has become tighter because some of it is being, you know, flowed uh, uh, towards the park and so on. Again, just one of the examples of, you know, when, when we do something, uh, you know, there's, there should not be any direct presumption that, you know, it, it's fundamentally right or fundamentally wrong. We have to be very, very mindful of what else it entails. And again, going back to those values, those values of justice, tranquility, uh, liberty, security, and prosperity. Uh, are, we, are we really thinking holistically and, and, and honestly about those things? The chart on the right uh, basically maps out water consumption for solar operations uh, in the India against, which is the x-axis, uh, water stress level. And you, what you see here is, a lot of the installations are happening. The, the bigger the circle, the, the more the water consumption. And the farther you're on the right, you know, that's more water stress. And you, you do see uh, that a lot of this is being built in you know, water stress levels. And uh, we are talking then about you know, farmers and communities and, and uh, urban and rural areas. And, and this is what you know, the trade-off basically we are looking at. This is, remember, this is still very, very early stages. Okay? We are talking about something, a transition that has started, that just started. Uh, and by just, I mean, you can, you can name it 10, 15, 20 years max, uh, but also, you know, something that needs to accelerate uh, both in terms of scale as well as in terms of uh, timeline. Okay, so, so those were some, you know, uh, highlights of what, what we're dealing with uh, in, in terms of what communities could face. Uh, something else I want to highlight, this is a piece, very interesting piece that came out in Science a few months ago, uh, which basically highlights uh, what's happening with batteries and the materials that both come into the batteries, but then you know, what happens after the batteries uh, have been used, uh, right? And again, long story short here is it's, it's a, a lot of what we're envisioning for our new transportation systems depends uh, you know, almost entirely on these types of batteries. There is no plan that at least I know of uh, that uh, is, is holistic in terms of supply chain and in terms of you know, what we do in the afterlife life of these. Uh, batteries. There's time for us to do it. Uh, that's not, uh, you know, but the point is, uh, this is not the scale that we're talking about. This is not an issue that can be sidestepped saying, hey, you know, uh, let's deal with the other problem. No, uh, this is also uh, part of uh, the thinking and part of how we want to build and develop our, our, our infrastructure. Lots of great ideas. And this is exactly where you know, science, innovation, uh, technology really come into play, become very, very important. But, but again, being mindful and not uh, just having a mindset of, you know, let's just do this other thing and that's better or, or worse. No, uh, I don't think in my view, it, it doesn't and shouldn't work uh, that way. So that, that's my, you know, long winded way of uh, setting the stage to say, uh, you know, as we go about the transition, uh, we have lots of very, very important things to be mindful of. And it's not just about, you know, uh, going about closing our eyes, eyes and you know, building things uh, at scale. So that brings me to this a study uh, that was um, uh, coordinated by the National Academies, uh, National Academies, and uh, it was a it was a, an ad hoc committee that was on accelerating decarbonization of the uh, U.S. energy system. It was led by Steve Pakala. Uh, not it was; it's still an ongoing committee. I was very fortunate uh, to have been a part of it. Um, and this is, you know, the committee drew from both academic as well as you know non-academic non uh, expertise uh, throughout, and it came up with. Uh, it's first of it two re two reports earlier this year. The second report is due in uh, 2022, uh, and the first report really looked at the you know next next 10, 15, 20 years in terms of you know the path that we need to set to really decarbonize the the U.S. Uh, energy sector. Uh, and the charge of the committee was not to 
find out whether we should do it or not. That was almost assumed. The charge really was, what are the principles uh, that and, and how really we should go about doing this? Uh, and so, you know, I, I want to bring in some of the highlights of that and then, uh, you know, take, take you with some additional uh, remarks leading from that. So uh, a very distinguishing feature of this report was that it fundamentally centered around these, you know, social, socioeconomic uh, goals. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, that's typically lost in the discussion. What this committee and what this report did is actually brought it to the center, very center of the whole discussion. So, you know, uh, both in terms of thinking about technologies, but then also, you know, our, our suggestions around policy instruments uh, were all centered around how they map, map back on these, you know, four socioeconomic goals. And those have to deal with strengthening the U.S. economy, which is basically think about uh, our economy innovation as well as uh, global competition and how we will stay strong there, supporting communities, businesses, and workers, uh, including both who are directly and adversely affected by the transition. Uh, you know, I, I gave the example of coal communities earlier, and there are many other communities that, that will be impacted in different ways. Uh, the flip side of that is the third one, the third pillar, which is promote equity and inclusion, which is historically in, in energy. Uh, you know, it's it's replete with examples of you know, injustices and in inequities. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later or to that theme, but, but it's essentially keeping an eye on that uh, very firmly and, and addressing that. And then lastly, but, but also very importantly, maximize cost effectiveness. We don't have infinite budget. You know, uh, we are all in the midst of uh, what's happening in the, in the Congress. And you know, we know how important that whole discussion of cost effectiveness is, but it is one of the other goals and it is not exclusively uh, of, of importance because you know, the whole tag the committee took is just going that route uh, actually doesn't get, get us the energy system that we want, which is you know, just and fair. In terms of the technology goals, they're basically, you know, once you take you know, one of those uh, pathways of 1.5 or two degrees, you know, basically, essentially at the very high level, we are left with you know, three different uh, uh, action items. Number one is electrify more of the energy services in transportation buildings and energy. Uh, and one example of that is for, you know, for, for the US, you know, it could mean roughly half of uh, vehicles being sold in the US uh, be electric vehicles by 2030, right? So very, very fast and very tall order. Uh, the second pillar is improving energy efficiency and productivity. That, that's extremely important, very fundamental. Uh, in Texas, we went through a blackout in February, and you know, that has you know, given a whole different level of meaning to energy efficiency and, and demand and productivity. Uh, the third pillar is producing all the electricity. So after electrifying more, uh, you know, producing the remain whatever you need to supply that with carbon-free uh, electricity. Uh, and again, you know, I, I have some more data on that a little bit later to to show what what that could look like. And then there, there are two additional things that are very important. Uh, we don't know everything. Uh, we don't have. Uh, we know a lot about the technologies and what tool sets we have, uh, but you know, they're not all at the levels of technological performance or economic or cost performance that, that would be amenable to very large scale up. Uh, and so you know, continuing to expand the innovation toolkit, for example, uh, on electrolysis for hydrogen, on, uh, to, for producing hydrogen or you know, carbon capture storage, new battery materials, just, just name it, right? So continuing to really uh, uh, keep progressing on that. And finally, uh, build, planning, permitting, and building critical infrastructure. And we are talking about uh, EV charging networks, which are talking about carbon, carbon uh, CO2 pipelines, and uh, just name it, uh, transmission lines, uh, right? So, so this is you know, in what we're talking at a very high level in terms of the technologies. There was a study that came out from Princeton University a little, little you know, less than a year ago, end of last year. Uh, it's the Net Zero America study, you know, really uh, fascinating work. And I, you know, it's it's a, you know, lots of information in the report. I just pulled out one chart that shows uh, what we are talking about cumulatively in the U.S. between now and 2050. So for the next 30 years, we are talking about wind and solar installations roughly eight to ten times of current levels, transmission capacity roughly thrice uh, of current levels, and you know, there, there's you can see the geographical uh, variation here, right? Uh, and then there's lots of other things we can talk about. Uh, this in terms of what it means for you know wind or solar versus you know oil and gas or nuclear, uh, but but you know we can come come back to some of those in the Q and A. Rather, the the point is that of uh, of of scale and how do we go about uh, doing this? Right, uh, we have been 
deploying a lot of uh, carbon-free electricity in the re recent years, uh, but tripling that is a, is a very different uh, uh, task. Uh, and, and tripling that in the next 10 years, uh, multiplying that by eight times, eight to 10 times over the next 30 years. So, so now moving on to the, you know, kind of uh, the second part of the discussion. Uh, this report basically came out just a few days ago. This is the annual uh, utility scale update from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And what you're seeing is price of utility scale over the last 15 years or so, and how dramatically they have come down, right? You know, all the way from 150, 200, 15 years ago, dollars per megawatt hour. Now you're talking, uh, what, 20, 30 dollars per megawatt hour, just in a fascinating 80 to 90% uh, drops in some cases and in larger and larger projects coming online. So that's, that's one side of the story. Uh, I already gave you the example in what, some what you know some of what we're seeing in places like you know not just in india but you know uh, throughout uh, there is a flip side to that story uh, which is uh, you know there's, there's a lot of misinformation disinformation on both sides right you know in terms of the harms that solar can do and also in terms of you know uh, the benefits that solar can have for example tax benefits for local communities and so on again you know i'll come back to this theme of uh, what is what is right or wrong a little bit later uh, but the main point here being that as companies and as industry coalitions think about deployment, right, it is extremely important that, uh, you know, this all be done in a very uh, community-based fashion. There's a collective responsibility that needs to be taken and, and involving public because again, we are talking not just one piece of the infrastructure, rather the whole thing. And you need all of it, all the way from building these things to the transmission, to building off infrastructure in demand centers to basically you know, use uh, whatever is being produced and all pieces need to move in sync. Uh, and you know, fundamentally you're, you're changing the way people live, the way people uh, work the way people interact with each other, and and you know it's it's all about them. It's all for them in many ways, uh, right? And there are great benefits, but again, it can't be uh, you know without them, even in the process of you know building and 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 doing all of this. Otherwise, uh, there is a there is a very not even a danger. There's a very real real possibility, and it is already happening in many different ways. Uh, of you know this really running into all kinds of you know roadblocks uh, all the way. It's a very good example, and I had the book copy right here. It's a really great uh, book called "The Radiance of France" uh, about nuclear power and national identity after World War II. It really looks at the case of France and you know how nuclear really uh, grew in France, uh, and contrast that with some of the experience in the U.S. and and this aspect of working very closely with the public, working very closely on understanding uh, the concerns and building things with them at the center of the decision-making uh, was one of the very important factors of you know, why France was able to achieve in nuclear what, what it was able to do. And there are very important parallels uh, to that. Uh, now, coming back to the current policy landscape, uh, we are all very, you know, this this is uh, as fresh as, you know, yesterday, a few days ago, right? We're all in the middle of this. Uh, and as of yesterday, we, there was news that President Biden uh, is, is already talking about scaling back the broader uh, social uh, agenda in terms of the programs. And and we see, obviously, you know, why, why that is. And on the right, you see, you know, this op-ed that uh, Senator Manchin wrote, uh, uh, Few weeks ago, saying why he could not uh, support the the ongoing uh, the, the current plans of you know three point five billion dollars of, of 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 spending, and that is that is the current status. You know, it's it's any one of our calls. Certainly, you know, uh, I, I I have my views, but I can't really call where we'll actually uh, land. It is you know way too complex, way beyond you know anyone's uh, uh, one person's analysis, whether it will be. Two trillion, even will even that will pass, and even if it passes, what happens next year? What happens uh, in four four years from that? You know, again, the, these are government programs that involve uh, policymakers again who are in very different context and and uh, trying to serve very different constituencies. And you know, there is a you know very uh, diverse set of preferences, very diverse set of backgrounds, and very diverse set of uh, interest that basically inform that process, right? Uh, 
one thing that, that we know from the history of building infrastructure investment, how important it is to signal commitment, how important it is to signal continuity and how important it is to provide that clarity in terms of uh, in the investment environment. And, and that is just certainly not the case right now. And even if we land there uh, in, let's say, in a few weeks, in a few months, uh, there is always that question of, you know, what happens uh, in, a, in a few years. And again, you know, certainly not, not my call uh, in terms of, you know, where exactly that will land. And my point here, here is to highlight the, the contrast of what we are talking about in terms of what needs to be built, uh, the type of clarity and the type of uh, environment it needs to be built. Uh, and the political reality of the situation in terms of moving that uh, forward again. So, so my fallback here is, uh, you know, uh, both because of the fundamental social values, but then also how, you know, a, a stable foundation for all of this, including how it impacts the political process itself in the longer run to build, build a bottom up, right? Uh, to build, start from the communities, uh, both who are impacted now or, you know, could, could potentially uh, rebuild or become stronger as we as we look to the future, uh, building building up up from from there. Now I will I will bring in now some elements of uh, interaction biases and you know how we all you know may make certain decisions, but in particular the role of uh, communities and our information networks in that. You know Facebook has been so much in the news, so I I couldn't help myself but have a slide about and uh, some, some data from Facebook, in this case, a you know, very, very interesting one, a paper, 2015 paper in science uh, that looked at you know, something you know, we, we all kind of you know, know anecdotally very well, but, but uh, very interesting to see uh, bear out in data, which is our, our affiliations uh, and based on self-reported ideological uh, affiliation. And so here, what you see that liberals uh, say, you know, most of their ties are not say, but you know, this is actually from the data. All you do in the data is you know, self-identify as, as being a liberal and then the network can calculate who is in your network, right? Uh, roughly 60% of liberals are, have liberal ties. Uh, on the other hand, uh, over 70% or nearly 70% of conservatives have conservative friends. Again, you know, this is that aspect of uh, you know, really this us getting news and having being interactions which are already very aligned to what, what we know about and this notion of notion of uh, echo chambers, right? And so this is this is one part. And there's obviously, you know, there, there are types of interactions and uh, forums where, where you basically try to uh, deal with it, break that those silos. But but in general, you know, that is that is something that we all are uh, very familiar to and it's, it's known as you know confirmation bias. Uh, something else that is very relevant to what we are talking about is in novel and uncertain situations. Uh, we all turn to trust-based networks. So, you know, for example, uh, all the different technologies that we are talking about, the impacts we are talking about on climate and our, you know, society's economies, or what it means for us in terms of our own living and jobs. It's, it's, you know, it, it's there are you know thousands of scientists and scholars uh, who are working currently across the world, uh, not just now, and they've been doing it for decades. And you know, there, there is lots of you know still things that we do not know. So, it, it is a very, very complex interacting set of things. Um, and it's very complex also for, you know, almost, almost everybody as an individual and a household. And when that happens, uh, we all fall back to uh, trust-based networks. There's a whole fascinating literature on, you know, how all that plays into uh, decision-making adoption and diffusion of different things. What it means for us is in conversations like this, be it about policymaking, be it about direction of where you want to head in the next few decades and changing our energy system and so on. Conversations are happening in within these chambers and it's it's kind of very hard to break them from top down. It just, you know, it doesn't work that way, right? Because the top down is basically in many ways a reflection of what already exists at bottom up and the top down basically reinforces. That is a very, very stable way in, in how our uh, political, social political system actually works, uh, right? And so this brings me back again, is you have to get into these, these chambers and understand the operations and values and you know, really pay great attention to the difficulties and the concerns. It's not about, you cannot get in saying, uh, hey, we have a solution. Yeah, you know, there is a problem and you're part of the problem. Uh, here's a solution, let's do it. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. But the good news is 
you know, there are great ideas of being able to alleviate all of those concerns, both in terms of you know, economic uh, solutions, but then also in terms of you know, technological and social solutions to dealing with it. So, so there are great ideas on the table, you just can't force it, right? You have to understand and, and really uh, evolve those solutions and, and seed them and, and let them go and take their, uh, take their uh, let them you know, scale up and get, get, get designed. Something else I want to share is, you know, we haven't published this yet. We are in the process of writing this up, expected to release this report uh, in a few weeks. Uh, this is a survey that uh, we did at UT of Texas. It's a representative survey of Texas uh, households, but within a few weeks of uh, the winter storm URI. So right after the blackouts happened, we designed the survey and, and uh, asked, asked several questions uh, all the way from who, who was exposed to what types of impacts and what it meant uh, for them and you know, what, what they think they will do. So, so there's a lot in this. The one that I wanna highlight, again, goes back to this aspect of heterogeneity uh, in terms of uh, what we think the issues are, what we think the solutions are, but then also how those heterogeneities actually map back to communities, right? Communities based on race, race ethnicity or communities you know, based on and geography, in this case, we, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not showing it here, but some very, very interesting differences, both in terms of uh, impact, but then also in terms of uh, perceptions in Houston versus Austin versus San Antonio versus Dallas and, and, and everywhere else in, in Texas. All right, so what you're seeing here is uh, some ideas around, on the left is, uh, these are policy solutions that were actually in discussion at the time. Uh, some of that have been resolved and some of that is still under consideration. Uh, but we asked folks, uh, what's your preference, right? On a scale of one to five, one being strongly in support, five being, you know, uh, not being in support at all for these different policy choices. And, you know, you, you, you can make your own sense of the data. The only thing I want to point out is, uh, you know, things like, for example, when you, and we, have, we see similar things on in other items, uh, for example, increasing, should we increase renewable energy to solve uh, what we saw in February, and you see a huge heterogeneity, almost a one point separation between different you know, et, uh, race and ethnic groups. Um, and you know, this, this kind of repeats in, in some other ways too. And you know, again, it, it goes back to centrally the types of uh, values, but then also the types of networks that we all basically live with and live in that basically inform uh, all those things. And understanding what those are is basically the key to, to uh, really having effective solutions. On the right, you see uh, the difference uh, between self-identifying Republican versus independent compared to self-identified uh, Democratic uh, affiliation, also along those same you know, different policy solutions. And here you see a difference uh, that is you know, uh, one to two like a, like a uh, point scales uh, high. And it's, it, it really uh, aligns very well with you know, uh, ideological uh, affiliation in this case. And this is one of, you know, hundreds of studies that, that, that are out there that basically uh, would say the same thing. And so what does this even really, what does this all uh, point to? It, it all points to, again, and now going back to the National Academy's uh, study, uh, fundamentally, we have to do this transition in a way that ensures fairness and includes uh, public participation in the decision making. And this, this goes back to having a role robust social contract, right? This is not about, hey, here is a problem, here's a solution, let's go do it. Rather, uh, how does this flow through our social values and our, our broader socioeconomic system in very fundamental ways, understanding that and building up from that. Uh, also, uh, the report recommends that all stakeholders involved in the energy transition and you know, in sectors, governments, uh, you know, uh, companies, as well as civil society organization should systematically engage the public, right? Uh, and it is so fundamental to the entire thinking in the report. And I just got an alarm from, uh, that I had set for myself. So I'll keep moving. I'll, I'll skip over some of these examples, but you know, uh, try to end with some concluding thoughts is you know, lots of the you know, question that, that is uh, obvious to ask. And that is where you know, I, will, I will stop short of saying uh, it's so obvious or I have a solution is if you do these things bottom up, do they really add up to uh, you know, 1.5 or two degrees or the carbon profiles that we have, uh, do, 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 does it add up? Uh, you know, uh, certainly there is reason to believe, we can talk about that in Q&A, 
Uh, it is not obvious, but what I tried to convey is building bottom up is a necessary condition, right? Will it be sufficient is where a lot of the work uh, certainly needs to uh, happen as well. I'll, I'll, I'll skip some of these examples uh, and, and end with, with a couple of very interesting things. Is now one, one it, you know, what I said is we have to build bottom up and we have to understand the values and how we interact and how we make decisions to uh, enable this transition bottom up. Uh, and what else can we say beyond saying, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge and recognize that. And there's some very, and this is, you know, again, me trying to introduce some relevant literature, uh, depending on your, your background, you might find this interesting, is uh, some literature around uh, behavioral approaches and, and how folks make decision, decisions. And one of the things, you know, obviously is, you know, anchoring, which is depending on uh, what we already know and things that we interact with and things are more salient to us, we basically try to take those and, and project those to other things uh, which may not, you know, scale necessarily. So, you know, this very interesting paper by uh, colleague Sazi Natari, again from Indiana University uh, uh, in 2010, that basically talks about actual versus perceived uh, energy uses of different types of, you know, uh, uh, appliances and so, so on. All right, and there's a huge, this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, I see Valentini popping up, so yeah, I'll take a couple minutes. And, and likewise, you know, something very important is uh, this aspect of if we are expecting negative news, right? Uh, we basically, rather than interacting with the news, with the information, we rather stick our head in the, this, this ostrich actually had, has its head in sand, as you can see in the photo. And this is known, uh, this is known uh, in, in all types of things, including uh, many, many of us will identify in, you know, uh, stock investments and so on personally, uh, when we know we are probably going to lose money. And that was what this paper actually focused on. We actually don't look at the information as much. And this is my final slide. Uh, uh, and, and that's about, you know, two very important things, a very, very interesting paper by Linda Stegg um, that, that says, you know, public involvement in decision-making can foster, right? So, you know, there, there is a long, and this is, you know, this is a review paper, so basically brings in much of the literature, but importantly, it says that it, it cannot be just superficial, right? It cannot be, hey, let's just have some meetings and you know, make a show of that interaction. Rather, their opinion needs to be seriously considered in decision-making and can have an actual impact on decisions. And right, go, going back to the nuclear example in France, a lot of that actually, you know, happened. And the second thing is, uh, values and trust affect how people perceive different benefits, costs, and risks of the energy systems, energy policies. And here it becomes very important, right, in terms of who is interacting with these communities, right? If I go in, uh, do they really perceive me as somebody they trust? Doesn't matter what kind of an expert I am, they will <laughs> pay no attention, they will give it a damn uh, what I'm talking about. It's very important to pay attention when you're talking about you know, how to uh, make these, these changes. Uh, I will not talk anything about this, but really fascinating, you know, going back to what is truth, uh, who is right, who is wrong, disinformation, misinformation, or, you know, the truth. Uh, a colleague uh, uh, here in uh, philosophy, uh, Kathleen Higgins, uh, she had this, you know, piece in Nature that talked about, hey, you know, there, there is value in being a little bit modest. There is value in doubting yourself and your ideas a little bit and being open uh, to other things goes back to, you know, all the things I was talking about, the Gujarat solar example I gave, the battery example I gave, right? You know, let's not close our eyes and be open to other things. Last slide is, and, and the, I'll, I'll go to the very end here, which is localized policy, regulatory business and public experience with actual deployment across markets is critical. Uh, you know, it, this cannot be top down. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, although, you know, not to say we don't need top down things. Of course, it's, it's not to say, uh, we can do without them, but that's not uh, the, the, the route that will get us there. And bottom-up approaches, including local partnerships and experimentation are very important. And these are two books from uh, my former advisor, David Victor. Uh, uh, one of them is already out there and the other one that, uh, is, is basically about to come out. That's the one on the right. And I really encourage you to uh, take a look, look at these to get some, some more detailed information. So thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion.